happy hour. Yes. Bienvenidos a la iglesia. Yes. The aura de feliz. How's that? We just got um, corrected by the actual person that speaks Spanish fluently. Um, <laughs> I have been butchering the Spanish language in front of Ray for 25 years. And so um, he just smiles and on the inside he's boiling with rage. <laughs> he is. He's like, it's about time, Kev, you learn my, the actual language. Um, but... Uh, all right, well, let's go ahead and open with prayer, and uh, we're going to try our question and answer time. I do have some fun, um, some things I'd like to get into. If you guys don't have any questions, I have a fun little discussion we can get into that I was bouncing off um, Pastor and Mark this week. And uh, so let's have some fun getting into the Bible, shall we? Let's pray. Father, I love you, and I thank you for the Word of God, and I thank you for wisdom and i ask that you would give us wisdom today help us to be biblical help us to be wise help us to be to rightly divide the word of truth and not butcher it with a fork or butter knife and um father we just ask for your help we ask for your presence today i ask that our spirit uh, your spirit would be with us and our spirit would be in the line of yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's start out with something you got out of your Bible, answer to prayer, something God do in your life. Um, I'll start because it's usually that awkward pause when I first try to instigate this. So I'm going to start. Jesus, this is after his resurrection, John chapter 20. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Um, such a good passage of scripture. Um, there's a whole lot of different places we go with that, but that's, I have a whole page I wrote down, um, but we'll not do that. Um, anybody else? Get some out of your Bible this week. Um, Anyone? Anyone? Kim? Um, this isn't from the Bible, but I, there's, a, there's a good newish song out now, and one of the lines in it is, the things I'm afraid of are afraid of you. Hmm. <laughs> Spiders are afraid of God. Snakes are afraid of God. Ants, <laughs> creepy. I don't like ants. I don't like ants. No, no. Well, see, I grew up in the '80s when they had all those movies about the bees and the ants and the worms and things, tarantulas, and the ant one freaked me out. I was like nine. That's. That's not even a movie, okay? That's a mockumentary. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Pastor. Um, I think I might have mentioned this on Wednesday, but it really stuck out to me. I read it on Wednesday. Um, where, in fact, I know I mentioned this on Wednesday, so I apologize for the rerun because it's been on my mind. Where Ben Hadad was coming against uh, Ahab. And even though Ahab was a wicked, wicked man, um, God still defended Israel. And I don't know, it just speaks, it speaks volumes to me about the sovereign plan of God. Where we're like, oh, we have Joe Biden as president. That, that doesn't alter God's work one way or another in one perspective. In another, it does. But in one perspective, we can rest knowing that God is in control. Amen. And the leader doesn't interrupt God's covenant. Well, his covenant isn't with America. Oh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> yeah. Kim? In regard to that, I think that 
this passage where there were 7,000 men of arms in Israel. Yeah. They killed 100,000 yeah. footmen. Yeah. <laughs> Syrian footmen. Yeah. In one day. Yeah. 232 princes, if I remember correctly, of Israel. And 27,000 were killed by a wall falling down. Oops. In Aphek. Don't stand by the wall. Yeah, I, I have a fear of walls. <laughs> and if Trump is combined with walls, I'm running. Uh, Brother Ray? Yes, I've got a question. Sorry. Uh, we're reading the we're reading motions yesterday. Yeah. Oh, it's not. Está bien. Dígalo. No, go ahead. Why not? Go for it. Go for it. Fire away. We're ready. Expand my knowledge. All right, now your question. Yes. 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 She does that. She gets the silver. Now the next chapter over, there's a whole new chapter. And now you mentioned again, they mentioned 1100 pieces of silver. And I'm wondering if that's the same lady, which I know it's not. Um, now my curiosity is peaked. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like right after the next chapter. I touched the screen of my of my laptop. laptop. What what chapter, Brother Ray? It's uh, chapter 16. Okay. The money they offered Delilah for um, betraying Samson, 1,100 pieces of silver. And then the next chapter is Micah and the Levite. And he offers the 1,100 shekels of silver they stole from his mother. Does it ever say who his mother was? No, it doesn't. That's an interesting question. I don't know. Does it say whether Delilah was Jewish or not? Or is she Philistine? So I don't know. I don't know. Maybe someone just took it from her. I don't know. It's kind of that's an interesting little. No, I'm, gonna have to, I'm gonna have to look that up. That's very interesting because I know the story of Micah and the silver and the and the Levite. I know that story. I've heard um, what's his face preach that very famous sermon about him. Um, yeah. Um, so I've heard that, and I've listened to that sermon thirty times. Um, and uh, so I, I know that story, and that is very interesting, that the piece of silver, that is very interesting. I don't know. Yeah, very suspect. But Micah was a man of Ephraim. He wasn't, he wasn't Philistine. Um, what an interesting parallel. What an interesting coincidence. Any thoughts about that one, Rev? No, but I'm Googling like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I will, I'll play with that one this week. Maybe we can make that something fun we do our, our opening line next week. Let me, let me do some playing on that one. I think that's just a, a really cool coincidence, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, it could be the person that inscribe the, the, the book of Judges, it could be that there was a purpose that they put 1100, 1100. I don't know, but we'll, I'll work on that one. <laughs> hey, Siri. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> my, my, iPad, my iPad is like, yes. So I have, I have, a really Fire away. Delilah was Michael's mom, so Micah's mom. Um, but Rashi 
he's an ancient rabbi. He contends it was fundamentally impossible. Uh, the rabbis maintain that Micah preceded Samson by many years and lived during the time of Tusha, Greek, of Thaim, and of the judge Othniel, the Kenizzite, uh, based on uh, the state of the law. So basically, we're going way back in new traditions. Yeah, I think so. If they're arguing about it, then we don't know. Right. They don't argue about things that we know. Well, right. They argue about everything. Yes. That does make sense. Could you look at what was going on in the time of the judges that Micah seems like needs to be earlier? It does seem that way. And the book of Judges seems to be arranged in a way that shows a descending pattern. Correct. Chronological one rather than the behavioral one instead. Correct. So, but 1100 also might be another number kind of like um, uh, 40 or 7, a symbolic number meaning a large sum. Some have said that 1100 was... Um, 110 years wages. <laughs> and I don't know what the point of that is. 10 shekels of the year's wages. So right. People mention that. That's some sort of extravagant 110 years wages. Yeah, it might have just been a number that they threw out in tradition. Yeah. That, that could be why. It could just be, you know, um, she might have just had a big chest full of money. And I mean, who knows if there was actually 1,100 shekels in there? I mean, who's going to actually count that out? Um, so it just might mean that she had a really nice 401k. Um, cause it could be, um, and that's the beauty about when we dive into the ancient Jewish literature that we've got to understand there's so much symbolism and so much, what's the word I'm looking for? Tradition and painting of picture. I mean, that's Hebrew is a picture painting language. And so we, that's why the danger of, of, interpreting everything in an exact literal sense. In fact, Mark and I talked about that this week during our weekly call. We talked about being stuck in looking at everything in an exact um, literal interpretation. That's why prophetical people and even people that go back to um, um, that look at the Old Testament and the flood and things like that, and they take a lot of those things in a literal fashion or prophecy in exact literal fashion, you've got to be so careful because Jewish tradition was you paint this beautiful picture. And to think that everything is this cold, easy cut, literal um, explanation, it's just not like that. So that I think that's that's pastors probably spot on about. Just might mean there was a whole lot of money. We'll give you this big bucket of money. Um, And uh, that's a really good question. Wow, that was a good one, Brother Ray. Way to open up the ball on that one. Good job. Pearl? Go for it. <laughs> What's the reference again? 2014. Sorry. <laughs> well, there's a balance there. Fearing God, yes, that's all. That's a foundational truth we find all throughout the Book of Proverbs. But there's also a healthy balance of proper fear, improper fear. Right, Jalen is. Um, we can get, we were talking about that, that what real fears, you know, standing on a precipice of a thousand foot cliff, that's something to be afraid of, you know, fearing that, you know, a goat may run out of the, the woods and gourd you. Well, that's probably not a realistic fear. Uh, I have, that's why, you know, um, <laughs> we are, we are kind of out in the woods. You never know, goat may pop out. <laughs> Did you go? Did you go potty a little bit? No. Okay. <laughs> so, I think that could be both, Pearl. You know, uh, you know, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I mean, that's a foundational truth of the Book of Proverbs. 
and you know, true happiness is found when we make that our foundation. But also there's a healthy place for fear in our life. And when we allow to have like, you know, pastor running like a little scared little girl across the field toward his house. Um, <laughs> that, uh, that potentially could be a healthy fear if there were reporting of rabid coyotes in the area. Um, that might that might be a healthy fear. Yes, ma'am. True. I think that's really good too. Um, yeah, that goes back with, to circumspect. That can never happen to me. Ask any anybody that's addicted to anything. Before they were actually addicted, they would say that would never happen to me. Um, I remember um, a teenager one time when I was I was giving them an admonition and a warning about something, and the, a teenager. I'm trying to keep this extremely. Um, easy so no one would understand who I'm talking about, um, literally looked at me and said, I would never do that. Um, about three weeks later, we kicked this person out of the Christian school for doing the exact same that they said that they would never do. Um, <laughs> so uh, when we get to the point of I, that, that can never happen to me. You drive down the highway and or you drive down 196 from Lisbon to Topsom. And, you know, when there's 19 inches between your car and the car behind you, um, well, you know, them having to stop really fast, that wouldn't happen to me. I'm just going to tailgate them, hoping that they'll speed up because there would never be any reason for them to have to hit their brakes. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I've watched way too many NASCAR um, Sundays, so I know it's okay to draft. You know, I've watched, I've watched NASCAR since I was, you know, eight, and so I know how to draft properly. And a little bump, and that's okay. They do it all the time in NASCAR. Um, and so... Uh, but I think that's that's very healthy too, Pearl. I think that 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 goes into the um, recipe also. Is just having a proper balance of fear is just um, it's just wise. Um, it's just a good thing that because that 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 allows you to put up proper boundaries and safeguards in your life. Um, that you know that we just have to be careful. Um, Stephen? Lest you fall, take you to yourselves. Um, because when, when someone said, I would never, I would say, I have the potential. There is no limit. Given the right circumstances, influences, and the long enough amount of time, there is no sin that I am not capable of. There, how's that? How's that for a reality? People that. Um, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> It ain't. Um, Micah? Is that just the verse or you have a question that goes with that? Okay. Well, I didn't know we're, we've, we've started to intermingle the testimony question time, so I was just... Right. Right. Look at 
in the book of Acts, I think chapter four, the first church stood in the public square and prayed for boldness. That's the spirit that God gave the church. Right. And boldness and things like that. But there is a um, a very real fear in which I'm not afraid of Mike Tyson, like trembling fear, but I would be really afraid to get in the ring with him. Right? Or mouth off to him on an airplane. Or mouth off to him on an airplane, right? Or it's real. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you're tall. <laughs> Right. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, because because fear of God is more of just an honoring, a proper positioning. Proper positioning, fear is like when you're up on staging three stories up, proper positioning of fear is really good. You know, dancing around and pretending that there's not, you know, 37 feet to fall. That's not a proper position of fear. Right. I'd be scared if I saw an angel walk in here. Yeah. Right. Yes. It's it's a proper respecting positioning. And that's that's the position of fear to God, Susan. That's that position of fear to God when anything angelic, anything heavenly, anything of a spiritual nature being shown up, whether it was the Lord Jesus after his resurrection, whether it's just an angelic being, whether it's God the Father speaking, whether it's Mount Sinai in Arabia shaking and thunder and lightnings, people got freaked out and straight on their face. Or they ran and said, you meet with God, Moses. You and, jo you and old Joshua go up the mountain. We'll be back at the camp there, but you just come back and tell us what he said. Um, so there's a positioning, and that's where they over-position that fear, where they, rather than having the position of respect and honor position, well, they're like, forget this, you know. <laughs> Dude, you, you enjoy being on the mountain, Tim. Right. And what a terrible an opportunity to literally hear from your creator, hear from Yahweh. Your, I mean, literally be at the foot of the mountains. Uh, and yet they chose to run and say, well, I'll be back in my tent sipping some tea. You just let me know what he says. What a what a uh, amazing opportunity missed. Brother Ray. Yeah. And so they forced themselves to need a Pope, need a Moses, when they literally could have been literally in the presence of, of their creator. <laughs> but that's just so nuts. And that's, that's besides the heresy over the last, you know, 1800 years, 1700 years. Um, that's my major beef with the Catholic Church is that God gives us the ability to have that one-on-one -on -one and say, no, I'm going to let the hierarchy, I'm going to let the priesthood be my go-between. I'm going to let the Pope and all of his little uh, minions almost said, yes. And then, then we're going to put Mary and then we're going to, you know, we're going to put all these mediators between us when when I've had success at witnessing to Catholic people, it's when you break that barrier thinking that you do not need the 17 different mediators when all you need is the Lord Jesus as your mediator. And when people realize that, we break down that necessary wall of having to have the popes and the priests and the hierarchy and the councils and all their, um, when I can come straight to my high priest, I can come straight to Messiah. And that's, that's the major, and that's where um, Catholicism really, really, really goes awry is because they built this wall and they removed the ability of me being able to come to my high priest myself. Um, and that's the major thing.
still has a convection in the building, and so the reason they because it gives people no small amount of comfort to be able to hear with their ears your children given yeah. and to be able to do something to a tone to feel that sense of completion, where it takes a well, no small amount of faith to believe that God really has forgiven you without atoning, without hearing it from somebody. And so I think the same human tendency played into the foot of Mount Sinai where Moses, you do it for us, and then they were going to basically have Moses as their mediator. Um, there, there is a degree of comfort there. Not necessarily lethargy, but just how we humans flock to a person as a mediator. Because it has to be set on Christ and no one else, or it fails. Well, that even comes to, oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Um, and our faith tradition to where we need the hierarchy, the pastor, the doctor so-and-so, the association of we're independent but we're not, people to tell us what's right, what's wrong, how exactly we have to dress, what kind of music we have to listen to, the format of our services, exactly when and where and how we're to meet. We have to get approval from to the point of, I know there's, oh boy, there is an assembly in our town where the pastors, husband and wife, make you, in order to be part of their assembly, make you pledge that they are now your mother and father, and you basically separate yourself from your family, your exterior family, and make that your family. And the pastor and his wife are your mom and dad, and they tell you what you can do, what you can't do, who you can associate with. Hmm? Oh, no, no, no. Um, and, and, but see, that's, that's where we've come is, is, and we come back to the fear that's a proper placement of respect and honor where we put in God's place, we put some dude that just really has no place being in that spot in our lives. We honor them as pastor. Go ahead, bro. And then the preacher and everyone else, they go, well, you're not wise enough to know that this is working for you. Then we become children that have to be told, well, you shouldn't leave. If we're adults when we walk in, why can't we be adults today? That's right. I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> and, I, and I really struggle with that mentality in a church when... I've got to come to pastor and say, what color should I paint my the walls of my living room? And I know that seems ridiculous, but I, I've never seen it taken actually that far, but I've seen that level of ridiculous where we put the respect and honor when in a very improper place. And we've, we've just gotten out of balance. We've not equipoised. Um, Pearl? You're good. Right. Well, let's, my parents, I love my parents. My parents are frail. They literally, my dad's in the hospital, really, really sick. So he's frail, um, but they have frailties. I honor them as my parents. My brother and I were actually talking about them yesterday about some of their frailties and my brother's like you know i'd really like to reprove them about some of their frailties he said but it's just so hard do i where's the balance between honoring them as my parents and step in and say well maybe you should not have this activity in your life um you know my dad's skydiving without a parachute probably not wise you know um but but so there's a proper balance of the the fear and the respect yes we're supposed to Fear God, honor the king. Um, that is proper. And it's just learning how to have that proper balance in our fear. Um, and in fact, um, 
we, Jalen, Mike, and I were talking about the other, uh, yeah, it was yesterday we were talking about that, learning to have a proper balance in our fears, you know, um, fearing God, understand that he is creator, he is God, he is our savior, he's our Messiah, he's our high priest, he's, he's everything, and then balancing the rest of our fears in a proper place. Um, Stephen? They didn't say, God, why did you bring us over here? Like, Moses, why did you bring us over here, God? And then when they, Israel won the king, it was the same thing. They, they wanted somebody between them and God. Yeah. So they had somebody to blame. Well, look at the rebellion of Korah. Perfect example of that. You know, um, you know, Korah and his followers say, well, we can be mediators. We don't just need this Moses dude. And then, you know, the earth opens up and swallows them all up. And, and then they're all like, Moses did that. Aaron, you did that. And then, of course, God comes and brings the plague. And Aaron has to grab the censer. And, um, and uh, thousands of people, I think thousands of people died during that one. I can't remember the exact number. A, a lot of people died. And it took Aaron literally standing between the living and the dead, um, waving that censer. With the, with the, with the, um, and so that's a perfect example of proper fear. I was going to, I do have, I have a great discussion on Aiken, uh, which we don't have time to get into. We only have a couple, three more minutes. Um, but, uh, but that's another place of having the proper position of fear. Um, and Aiken blew it because he lowered his fear of God and he took the curse thing. We'll maybe get into that next week, but. We're going to get into that 1,100 shekels of silver thing. I got to research that out and play with that one. Pastor? I know you were aching to talk about it. Uh. So I had this question already. Fire away. And it, it, it arose halfway through our discussion, but then, you know, when Pearl mentioned what she mentioned, the conversation has really evolved to come to a point in this discussion pastoral authority, right? It definitely exists in Scripture. Yes. In some ways, I think it goes beyond what a lot of pastors do. But in a lot of ways, perhaps more ways, it stops short of what a lot of pastors do. Yes. So in less than 90 seconds, no, I'm joking, but like pastoral authority, like where do you put that in a conversation that we've been having in terms of you know, like Pearl's concern is so valid. You walk in as adults, and yet you're either manipulated by fear or treated like a child, say you just don't know what the will of God is for you. There's sometimes when somebody's about to do something extremely stupid, um, it's not the will of God for anybody, and it doesn't make a path to say that. Thank you. But like at, at, what, at what point do we say, okay, that's not pastoral authority? You're meddling if you're trying to control somebody's life. I can't quote the man's name because he fell and fell hard and fell publicly. So I will keep his name out of the discussion. Um, I heard it described this way as area rugs. Beautiful. Um, in my life, let's say I was 15 years old. And I have teachers in my life. They have an area of responsibility and oversight as a teacher in my life. Then also I go to church and I have a pastor and he has his area rug of authority. I come home and I have my parental authority over me. And so I have my, my teacher has his, his area of, of influence, influence and authority. Then the pastor has his sphere of influence and authority. My parents have their sphere of influence and authority. And sometimes they overlap, especially if you're my kids and your teacher, your pastor, and your parent were all the same person. Uh, you're toast, man. Uh, Isn't that right, Josh? Remember those days? And, uh, <laughs> but, and so the equipoise, the balance, the proper fear 
authority, influence is understanding that in my home, it is not Michael Bridge's job to come in and explain to me um, what kind of shoes I allow Jalen to wear. That's not his sphere of influence and authority. Now, he may get up and say, I just don't think it's wise that she wears eight inch lifts, you know, to make her five feet tall so she can be a five foot tall. That was funny. Uh, she's going to twist an ankle, Kev. That may not be wise. Um, you know, those six inch stilettos, you know, and uh, well, she's trying to hit five feet. And um, so you have to understand the sphere of influence and authority. And so when it, like a child has the teacher, has the pastor, has the parents, and sometimes those boundaries overlap. Uh, now, if I go to my pastor and say, I'm having a struggle in my home. My son is rebellious. He doesn't listen to me. I want to take him to the gate of the temple or the town, and I want to have him stoned. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> Old Testament. But, and, I, and I bring him into my home. And I ask him to help me with my sphere of authority. Well, then, then I'm opening myself up for him to come in and say, well, maybe you shouldn't allow your son to, I'm thinking of something really ridiculous and off the wall, eat Jolly Ranchers after nine o'clock or, you know, have a mouthful of gummy bears before he goes to bed. Um, you know, and we wonder why he, his teeth are rotting out. Um, that I know he has the perfect teeth of everybody in the church cost me thousands of dollars anyway. And so that's when the sphere of influence overlaps, especially if I invite him over and I pull his carpet deeper into my area of influence now. So when it comes to pastoral authority, I have way gone over my 90 seconds. So pastoral authority is over the church. This is his domain. This is his area rug. And sometimes that area rug does overlap into a little bit of our home and maybe hence the, the teaching part of our kids that does overlap a little bit. But for him to come into oh, it's oh, it's like when you first became pastor here, um, another local pastor, a very over controlling pastor, walks into his office and starts looking through his books. This guy you don't need. This guy you don't need. This guy's OK. This guy you don't need. What, what is he doing? He's overstepping his boundaries of authority in his church. And that's how he runs his church. I don't know why someone would go there and be treated like a four year old, but <laughs> manipulated and treated like a four year old. Well, you're not wise enough and smart enough to realize that you need me to tell you what color socks you should wear, um, which like my, I got these really cool socks. My father-in-law gave me and uh, I know um, you're only out there Argo a sock on the first Sunday of the month. It's scriptural. Um, so what, what was he doing? He was overlapping the authority of his church and trying to pretend that he is the grand poopa of this area. And that's where we've got to be careful in our, in our spheres of influence and authority. That we stay within the boundaries of authority. Um, another quick example, I'll be done. I am the co-pastor, assistant pastor of the church. And uh, these are Michael and Amber's children. When they, when I'm in the church and they're running through the auditorium, dropping F bombs, you know, like fruit and um, fun. And they're, they're dropping expletives like a sailor on a battleship. You know what I mean? Well, guess what? That comes into my, and, and Michael and Amber are not around. And I hear a whole bunch of dirtiness coming out their mouth. I'd be like, dude, Barry, stop saying those words. Uh, that's when it comes into my area of influence. Probably shouldn't be having a six-year-old run around dropping expletives. That comes in now. But to me to walk into his home and say, dude, I'm sick and tired of every time I'm driving through the area and I hear Trigva dropping expletives as I'm riding by on my bicycle. That's overstepping my influence and boundary of, of, of authority. And we've got to understand that. And so um, 
you are a free, we, we teach soul liberty and we teach um, priesthood of the believer and we teach, um, you know, all these things that are, we don't need a mediator. And yet far too often in areas of leadership, we want to overstep and say, well, except for this area of life. Um, Kim? Yeah, and say, uh, dude, um, you know, your boys pretend to be sailors is probably not the best. You know, and, and I would give him a little brother to brother counsel, but I'm not going to come in with a two by four and smack him in the head and say, straighten up, um, because that's overstepping my boundaries. Iron sharpened iron, so a man sharpened the countenance of his friend. I can come in and give hearty counsel to my brother. That's proper. But to come and say, dude, I do not like the fact that you're letting your kids read Berenstein Bears. <coughs> I love parents taking bears. Um, but, but because that's not my area of influence. Um, and so that's, it's the balance and, and would be a great episode on equipoise um, is balance of influence and authority. Um, that's why if, if people aren't asking for my counsel, as much as I'd really, 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 really like to give it, you are 63 years old. Okay, I'm not going to say, do not wear those shoes ever again. It's not for you. Uh, <laughs> brother is like, <laughs> actually, I like your shoes. Uh, but that's, that's, and that's where healthy fear, respect, positioning, because you have those proper areas of fear and respect and position and authority. And that's where you achieve good, proper balance. Good one, Pearl. Great discussion. And we are a couple minutes over, but that's okay. And uh, that's okay. Great first opening of our question and answer. This has been fun. This will work. And, and, uh, but do that. Find, find something that just intrigues you. And, and we already have, so now we'll have Aiken and the number 1100. Well, that's okay. I'll just say it's heresy and we're, we're, we're going to Bobby Mitchell's church. And, uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, all right, well, let's pray and we'll shut off the live stream and get ready for service. Father, I love you. Father, teach us proper fear. Teach us proper respect. Teach us where real good scriptural authority is and where it's not. Fear God, 